Okay, ocean currents. So as you could just look at this picture, um, the big point that you want to take away here is that convection moves liquid, whether it's air, fluid, liquid, around the globe. Okay, so let's think about how this whole thing starts. We have the sun and the, you know, the, the, our sun, our nearest star, and it radiates thermal energy. Earth receives that energy. And so Earth receives it, and because it's a globe, it receives it in an uneven fashion. And the bulk of the thermal energy is received around that middle band, which we call the equator. And so as the Earth is rotating, that uneven heating allows the, excites the molecules and the, as we know, heat rises and then the cool air, the cooler air rushes in to take its place and that kicks the whole party off. So now we have convection all over the globe. And if we have this uneven heating and the, the warm air rising and the cool air coming in to take its place, <clears throat> excuse me, we call that wind. And so as the wind is blowing all over the globe, as we're blowing all over the globe, that drags on the ocean waters directing the, the currents. So that's kind of what you see in this first slide is how the result of convection. And we have the warmer currents, as you can see, st generating from the equator and the cooler currents as the warm air moves away from the equator it cools and drops back down and just has these big large conveyor belts of uh, of wind and convection moving warm air and cool air all around the globe so the warm currents flow away from the equator and Cold, air, uh, cold currents flow toward. Talked about the sun, talked about the uneven heating, the Coriolis effect, you know, be, you want to be, you want to know what that term is. And so the, the Coriolis effect really is as the earth is spinning, it's how the wind, it's how the, the wind bends because of a rotating earth. And so in the northern hemisphere, it's a clockwise, and in the southern hemisphere, it's a counterclockwise, simply because the rotation of the Earth. And then, of course, we have gravity, and we know that more dense objects sink while less dense objects will rise. And so cold is more dense, so it it sinks because of gravity. Gravity is grabbing a hold of those dense molecules and, and bringing them down. You can, that happens in the ocean, it happens in our mantle, and it, uh, and it happens in the air. So understanding that is really important. Those are, that's a really important statement I just, I just made. Again, the energy from the sun heats the water. And then that warm water is less dense than cold water. It's faster moving. The warm water rises, and as that warm water water is moving quickly in the sh in the uh, the currents, they move away from the equator, and it starts to cool. And that cool water sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And so that cool water moves really, really slow along the bottom of the ocean, but it still moves. In fact, if you were to take a water molecule off the coast of New York, 
<coughs> and it goes through all the con ocean convection. It would take a thousand years for those water molecules to go through the entire convection and come back to that same location outside um, New York. So just to kind of give you an idea how that works. <clears throat> As warm air rises or warm water rises, cold water moves in to take its place, just like the air. And that phenomenon also happens in our mantle. So there's three areas of convection in our mantle, in water, and in the air. You can look at that. I've already explained it, but uh, feel free to pay attention to the convection cycle. You probably should know this already based on what you've um, looked at this week. Just as wind moves from high pressure to low pressure areas, so does water. Wind blows across the surface of the water, causing friction and directing those ocean currents. So when you're looking at, uh, there was something you guys were looking at, um, the, the STAR tutorial that you did yesterday, the day before, there was that question of what direction is the water running or do, which, what, which direction does the wind blow? And you know that it blows from the east to the west, and that's just north of the equator. And if you think about it, that's exactly how hurricanes move. Hurricanes move from the east to the west in the Atlantic Ocean because of the wind. The wind drives the, the hurricanes. The wind drives the, the currents of the water. And there we go. There's a great example of the northeast trade winds between the zero and the 30 latitude. You can see that it goes from the east to the west. And that's the direction that those hurricanes move in. Already talked about gravity. Already talked about the Coriolis effect. <coughs> Yeah, because of the Earth's rotation, you can see that it moves in a clockwise in the northern hemisphere and then counterclockwise in the southern. Some facts on the surface currents. Don't really need to know those. Just know that the surface currents are the top of the water. They move quickly and the water's warm versus the bottom of the ocean that's cold, uh, cold currents. Little graphic to show you. Gyres, you know, we know that there's a lot of trash in the gyres because of how the currents are moving and what's going on with our, with our oceans and all the trash. Um, but a gyre is a vertical column or mound of water at the surface and, and um, it flows around them producing enormous circular currents. So, Major gyres, don't need to know these, just know that they exist. This is these ocean gyres, five main ones. The Gulf Stream, warm water, friends, warm water. Uh, definitely know, have an idea of this. This slide, kind of important. Upwelling, you don't really need to know this term. You may hear you may hear the vocabulary word in a in a test question. Just have an idea of what it means. So this ocean, and again, you know, pointing out, definitely find the United States. It's over there on the on the left hand side of this, and you can see that it's the the Gulf Stream moving up and then cooling and then going to the bottom of the ocean. It again, it takes a thousand years for that water to go through the entire convection system. Deep ocean current, 90% of ocean's water. The differences in density causes them to move really slow because they're super dense and salty. So the cold 
ocean, deep ocean currents are because of the cold temperature and the salinity. That is a very <clears throat> testable fact. The differences in temperature and salinity and the fact that they're super cold and super salty is what causes them to move so slow. Um, information on El Nino and El Nina <clears throat> or La Nina. You just have to have an idea of them. They may use those vocabulary words, but you won't be tested on the on the actual term. Just know that it exists. You can read that read through that. Yeah, cold currents cause nearby coastlines to be cooler. Warm currents cause nearby coastlines to be warmer. Just know also that, you know, cities located near the coastline typically have more moisture in the air because of the ocean, of the nearby ocean. And so because of that moisture in the air, their temperatures, whether they're cooler or warmer, won't typically change as drastic as places that are drier, as places that are inland, because that moisture in the air takes longer to cool off and warm up. So those temperatures are more stable. So just like in Florida, the, the coast, coastline temperatures are warmer and, and stable because of the warm water and its, and its southern location on Earth, meaning it's closer to the uh, equator. As you move away from the equator, these coastlines, the, you know, there's still gonna be moisture in the air, but you know, as you move away from the equator, the temperatures drop, it does get cooler, but you would expect there not to be a great change in those temperatures because of the moisture. The moisture tends to hold temperatures in a, in a kind of a realm that's that without great variation. <clears throat> and that's the end of that one. Um, we're gonna move on to the other, there's a couple more that we're gonna go quickly through understanding weather. So now that we understand how the how these convections work and whatnot, we're going to talk about how it affects our climate, which is long term. You know, the climate of somewhere being dry. You know, that's a that's a long term um, concept versus weather. Weather can change. Look at the weather here in Dallas. You know, we have a specific climate here in our area that doesn't change, but our weather changes all the time. So weather is very temporary versus climate is long term. So understand the differences between that. So we're going to talk a little bit more about weather here. Here here we go. We're not going to watch that video. You can watch that later. But the, the global convection affects local weather. So we're talking about global convection of ocean currents, global convection of atmospheric currents as well. Both of those things affect the weather. Weather, again, more temporary, it's conditions of the atmosphere at a particular time and place. So looking at that weather map, you see, just so you know, you see H, which means high pressure, you see a cold front, you see low pressure, you see warm front, you see stationary front, you're gonna be able to identify all that and, um, you know, as we move through here. So weather depends on heat, energy, air pressure, winds, and moisture. All of those things those four different factors. And if any one of those factors change, the weather changes. So as you can see, weather can change very, very quickly. So there's going to be another video for you to watch, which we're not going to watch right now. But I'm going to go quickly over these facts. High pressure systems bring sunshine and nice weather. Well, 
it makes it clear, okay? That's what happens. No clouds in the sky. So during the summer, that means it's pretty hot outside because there's nothing blocking the sun. It's just beating down on us. In the winter time, it can be cold still. But high pressure, what you really need to understand about high pressure is very little chance of precipitation. We want to almost go with no precipitation because clouds cannot form. Look at that. The, high, the pressure is high. The atmospheric pressure is high, so it doesn't allow cloud buildup. And if you want to get snowed on, if you want to get rained on, you need cloud buildup. So low pressure allows for that, allows for that cloud buildup. Low pressure systems bring rainy, cold, uh, cloudy weather because the air rises and cools, condenses to form clouds and precipitation. So remember, high pressure does not bring, bring heat it brings clear skies and low pressure brings clouds and precipitation. So definitely understand the differences of that. And you can see it on a weather map and I'll show you, let me back up a little bit. So look at the H where it's at. There's not very many clouds around that area. And then look at the L. Look at all those clouds around there. That's a great example of what high pressure and what low pressure um, results in. So we have a cold front. Cold front is on the, it shows on the left, um, the slide on the left or the picture on the left. You can see it's annotated by the blue triangles. And the triangles, whatever point, whatever direction they're pointing is the direction that that cold front is moving. So if you put your finger on where the triangles are, that's the front of the cold air mass that's behind it. As you can see, it says advancing cold air behind the cold front. So the front, as the front is moving through right where that, where those triangles are, that is where you can have the violent weather like um, tornadoes or, you know, some type of a storm, it can happen along that front. And then as the mass pushes through, the, 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 um, the weather stabilizes and it gets cooler, okay? So realize that the drama happens where the teeth are and as the um, the tri those those triangles and as the front of that oh, that air mass is pushing through that's where you can have that violent weather and then as the mass is over what once the the front of that air mass it moves through and you're just you know like in Dallas for example and then you have that cold air mass above that's when you have fair cooler weather so We'll be able to, I'll explain that, you know, in, in a different time. But anyway, so let's move on to warm front. Warm fronts bring rains and showers followed by warmer, milder weather. So the front, the half circles in red, they, as it moves through, the front can bring rains and showers, but then you're going to have that warm air mass that's going to be over the you know the location whether it's dallas or wherever you're at and that's when you'll have that warmer milder weather after the front of the air mass moves through okay stationary fronts occluded fronts these are the less tested versions of fronts so warm and cold definitely know those too um, but stationary front have a working knowledge i'll just explain them really quickly you have a cold front and a warm front meeting together Okay, and they're fighting for position. No, neither of them is moving anywhere because you have two, one, one front moving to the east, one front moving to the west, and they smash into each other. And so at that front, you can have rain, many days of rain and precipitation because you have two battling fronts. So that's how I explain stationary front. And then occluded front is when you have a warm front, um, when a cold front overtakes a warm front and they are moving in the same direction, it can produce strong winds and precipitation, but it's very, very rare. Uh, it's a very rare front, an occluded front or oculated, whatever you want to call it. I call it occluded. But, but that's, again, these are rarely, rarely tested. Just have a working knowledge of them. 
Um, and I'll, uh, so if you can see, go back to stationary front, you can see the line, you can see the, the triangles and the half circles. That's how it's written out for a stationary front. And on a, a occluded front, you have triangles and half circles going the same direction. So anyway, those are those two lesser known fronts and lesser tested fronts. This is a great uh, example of, of all of these fronts now that you can see them in the weather symbol review here, the cold front moving through. So look at California, Nevada, and Idaho. The cold front, the front of that air mass is starting to move through. So those areas are going to have that violent weather. But if you look at Oregon and Washington, the cold front already moved through. So now they just have cold cooler, drier weather. Look at Montana. Uh, there's a warm front that moved through Montana and it's going to go into Canada. Now Montana, um, the, the northwest of Montana is getting that warm front moving through. So they are dealing with clouds and precipitation, but most of Montana is warm. But what's interesting is here comes that cold front. So they're going to, because they have cool, warm air there, that cold front's about to move through. They have an opportunity uh, based on this weather map to get tor uh, tornadoes as that you know, cold front is moving through. Check out the H in the middle of the map. Notice there's nothing else going on there. It's because that pressure is really high and it blew out all the clouds. So there's no clouds in the sky and um, yeah, there's just, there's no clouds, no chance of precipitation. And then it looks like the, you know, the East Coast over there by Kentucky is, there's just a lot of drama going on there. They've got low pressure, there's an occluded front there. The cold front just moved through. So Virginia and um, North Carolina, they're about to get a, a cold front moving through. And they had, and again, same phenomenon as Montana. Uh, there's warm air, and now that front's gonna move through, there's chance of tornadoes, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we have the stationary front in southern Texas, where, as we talked about earlier, the cold front's moving down or south, while that warm front is moving north. And you can see along that line is going to be rain for, you know, a number of days because those two fronts have met, one going one direction and then one going the opposite direction. So there you go. There's, um, there's a weather symbol review for you. Um, and that's the end of that one. The last one, we'll just quickly go through it just to make sure that we have everything nailed. If there's anything new, uh, I want to make sure that we get, it, uh, we get it understood here. So let me pull this up for a lecture. Uh, okay. Wow, there we go. Moving on down. As we know, we already talked about this, the recipe for weather. Nope, not looking at that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the sun start kicks the whole party off because that thermal energy is received by Earth and it receives it in an un, uneven or unequal matter. Most of the warmth going towards or near the equator versus the indirect heat going towards the poles. So that really kicks off this convection uh, causing variations in temperature and pressure and driving the winds, which in turn drives the ocean currents. <clears throat> All points we've already gone over. There you go, great graphic of warm air rising, cool air rushing in to take its place. And when you step outside and you feel wind, that's what you are feeling. It's always cooler air rushing in to take the place of air that has been warmed up because of the surface of the earth being warm due to the thermal energy received from the sun and it rises because those molecules get excited and spread out and they rise, okay? <clears throat> and heat transfer is simply convection. And this is a little graphic of what that looks like. I'm just quickly going through this.
As you can see, you know, let's move that back. Convection can happen on the pot of a stove. The heat source is the bottom. The, so that's where the, the molecules get really excited and rise up. They cool off. Well, not necessarily cool off because it's still hot, but it's cooler than the water molecules on the bottom near the heat source. So that's what's really happening as your um, water boils. Ooh, so we already know all this. There's a lot of sound effects in this one, so enjoy. Anyway, we know what causes wind. It's the uneven heating on Earth's um, surface. Ah, a couple of different things. So there's two local area winds. As we know, as you saw from the graphics earlier, that we have those large conveyor belts of wind. So we have the easterlies going from the east to the west near the equator. But know that there's a difference between global wind and local wind. So there's two breezes that you need to be familiar with. There's a land breeze and a sea breeze. A sea breeze, as you can see, blow, the wind blows from the sea to the land where it warms up, rises, and then moves out to the ocean, cools off, falls again, and then goes in this local kind of convection that'll happen. So a sea breeze is from the air moves from the sea or the wind moves from the sea to the land and it happens during the day. Whereas a land breeze happens at night. So because the land is cooled off and the ocean, as we know, water molecules take longer to heat up and cool down. So during the evening, the water is warmer because it heated up all day long so that the, the wind blows out from the land to the sea, warming up and rising. So when you're standing on a beach during the day, you can feel the wind blowing from the ocean. And then at night, you can feel the wind blowing at your back out to the ocean. So those are local winds a sea breeze and a land breeze. You will be tested on this on your unit test, so make sure you understand that sea breeze is from the sea and its local area, and a land breeze happens at night, local wind, <coughs> and the wind is blowing from the land. <coughs> Excuse me. There's your another another great graphic of the global convection currents that happen. Great graphic. Air masses and fronts. Already talked about this, but it's another review of warm front, cold front, the two big ones you need to know. Occluded front, there you see the symbol, both of them moving in the same direction. Strong winds, heavy precipitation, but it doesn't last very long because both fronts are moving in the same direction. So it's very quick. Stationary front, front precipitation um, lasts for days. Jet stream, don't really need to know about it. Just be familiar. It's an animation for you. More graphics of wind belts. Not that you've seen, you, have, you, know, you haven't seen enough of those already, but as we know, global wind it's very it's uh, per very predictable and it moves in this fashion Coriolis effect another explanation feel free to look at that and that is the end of your weather and convection lecture please let me know if you have any questions thanks for listening